Well, good evening, Mount Pleasant. Thank you uh, for tuning in tonight. If you will, go ahead and open with me to Galatians uh, chapter number four. We're going to be looking at verses one through seven tonight. We looked at four uh, through seven this morning, but we want to, I want to kind of expand on that tonight. Uh, so Galatians four, one through seven. So just a little bit of a recap of where we were. Um, we looked this morning at the biblical doctrine of adoption. Uh, it's oftentimes an overlooked doctrine, uh, but it's, it's very, very important. And um, we saw some things here this morning, specifically in this passage, where uh, we see that God sent his son into the world to redeem those uh, who were under the law, who were under uh, the elementary principles of the world. And he did so for the very reason that we could be adopted, that we could receive the adoption of sons. And so uh, this is a very, very important doctrine. And we looked at it in five different ways this morning. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 1, we saw that um, that this was predestined, that this adoption was predestined. It was uh, it was planned before the foundation of the world. Uh, we saw in Romans 9, 4 through 5, how that, that plan sort of played out throughout the um, uh, the history of, of Scripture and primarily through Israel. Um, then we saw in Galatians 4, 4 through 7, where we're going to expand a little bit tonight about adoption accomplished uh, through Christ. Uh, then we moved on to Romans 8, 15 through 17, and we saw uh, how adoption was applied. Adoption was um, applied through uh, the Holy Spirit. And then we moved on to Romans 8, 23 and 29, and that was our final passage. Uh, where we saw that adoption uh, finally realized in in the last day. So tonight, like I said, I want to dive a little bit deeper into the Galatians passage. I want to look at all uh, seven of those verses. And, and so when we think about adoption at the human level, uh, like we did this morning, it's different than biblical adoption. Uh, but certainly, I think once we grasp biblical adoption, we can understand um, how there are some parallels there, uh, certainly, whether affected directly or, or indirectly through human adoption. I think we can all understand the process of, of someone being uh, formally adopted uh, on paper, right, to the, the full realization of their adoption in their everyday life, where they, they grow into that uh, to that relationship and into that love. Now, I think the same is true for our status um, as sons uh, of God. But I think we often have a problem. And like I said, adoption is oftentimes this overlooked doctrine. But I think it's overlooked in our lives as well on, on a um, experiential level. You know, we, we know that we're sons and daughters of God, but oftentimes we don't live like we are, right? We we have the status and the privileges uh, of, of sons, um, but you know, sometimes we're so prone uh, to go back and live um, actually like slaves. And, and this is the, the problem that um, Paul was dealing with here in Galatians 4. And the main point that he was really trying to get across uh, uh, to his readers and the point for us really is that the Father has adopted us so that we may live freely as his sons and daughters. Uh, so with that being said, let's go ahead and get into the text. And it reads like this, Galatians 4, 1 through 7. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until a date set by the Father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you were sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Now, before we can really understand the argument that Paul's going to make, I think we need to look at um, what he's already been saying. Uh, so in chapter one, uh, chapter 1 of Galatians, we see that there's false teachers, and they're called Judaizers, uh, and they're coming into the church to distort the gospel. This is what Paul says in 1.7. Uh, but the gospel that the false teachers were, were, were teaching uh, Paul says there's really no gospel at all. It's because apparently the, the false teachers were teaching that 
that Galatian believers uh, were ha- uh, were to be circumcised um, in order to be saved. Uh, in other words, according to the false teachers, salvation was uh, uh, by works plus Christ. It wasn't just through Christ. Uh, but as Luke pointed out in, in chapter 2, uh, Paul Paul's adamant about the fact uh, that, that we are justified not by works, but by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul even goes as far as to say is that if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. So this is very important to see the difference between um, uh, salvation by works and salvation through Christ, which is the true gospel. So then in chapter 3, we see that, that some of the Galatians had um, actually adopted this view that, that salvation was by works of the law uh, plus Christ. And then Paul continues on in chapter 3, and he sort of gives a brief overview of the Old Testament in persons like Abraham, Moses, and then eventually Christ. And so we saw that Abraham was given a promise uh, that through his seed, all the families of the earth would be blessed. And so centuries after Abraham, uh, Moses and the Israelites, they were given the law at Mount Sinai. And and Paul shows that both the promise um, and the law are important. So the promise that that all families of the earth would be blessed is certainly very important, a very very important theme for Israel. And then the giving of the law is very important for Israel as well, uh, in that we inherit the promise uh, by faith in Christ, the fulfillment of the promise, uh, because the law has been uh, illuminated or it has illuminated the fact that we can't obey it. So both are important in that the promise and the law, they ultimately point to and find their fulfillment in Christ. And so Paul furthers his argument in verses 29, uh, 3 through 29, and he emphasizes the fact that uh, that the progression of promise and law and fulfilled promise is not only a reality for for the Jewish nation, but for all of humanity. And, and this uh, reality, uh, or the reality is now that everyone is either in slavery to the law, or uh, they are in um, they are free in Christ. And so everyone is either under the law or in Christ. And, and with this, Paul moves on to chapter four, where he contrasts the life here of slaves and the life of sons. So the life of slaves we see there in verses uh, 1 through 3, and then the life of the sons in 4 through 7. And he's teaching us that that we are more than just justified. Uh, We are also adopted. We're not just declared righteous. We're also um, loved in that uh, that sonship is applied in our lives even now. And so we saw there... In the first three verses, the, uh, what it is, uh, what the life of a slave is. I think I've used this illustration before, uh, but I think it works well. Um, I'm a I'm a fan of Batman. I think many, maybe many many of you have actually seen the movies. I don't know if anybody's a fan, but um, I really especially like the Dark Knight trilogy uh, with Christian Bale. And if you aren't really familiar with Batman, uh, the main character is Bruce Wayne in these Dark Knight trilogies. Uh, He was born into a a very wealthy family, a prominent family in Gotham City. And uh, at the time of his birth, uh, Bruce was destined uh, to take over his family business. And the the, the estate and all that came with being uh, part of that 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 Wayne family. In other words, he would inherit the the, the wealth, the status, all the privileges. And, but as a boy, that inheritance that he has is not fully realized. Right? He, he enjoys the privileges, but it's not fully realized. He's still he's still young. He still has a lot to learn. And, and here's where um, Bruce's butler comes into play. Um, Alfred Pennyworth, and Alfred takes care of young Bruce. Uh, during his childhood, and this is really key um, for us, um, and it's it was for Bruce, uh, especially after the death of his parents. Uh, the point, though, is that what we find in Alfred um, uh, is that he calls Bruce something very important. He, he doesn't call him Bruce. Uh, he doesn't call him sport or champ or anything like that. Um, he calls him Master Wayne, and this is 
certainly Alfred is older and more mature and in charge at this point in Bruce's life. But he knew the future in store for, for young Bruce. And uh, there would come a time when he inherits in full what he is only in status or, or name. So the wealth, the status, the privileges, all that of being part of the Wayne family will be truly realized at the point of his inheritance. And I think uh, this sort of illustrates um, in part what Paul is trying to teach for us. He, he opens chapter 4 by stating, I mean, the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he's the son of every or the owner of everything. So Paul is showing that the Galatians that were that were under the law, uh, they are much like an heir during their childhood. That though this child, you know, Bruce, um, is the rightful heir to the Wayne family fortune, as long as he's a child, he's no different than a slave. His freedom uh, is limited. He needs direction. He needs discipline. He is, as verse 2 states, under guardians and managers uh, until the date set <clears throat> by the Father. And so Paul then continues or, or connects uh, this illustration of an heir in his childhood to what it's like for those that are under the law. And Paul writes, in the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. And in other words, uh, before Christ came to fulfill the promise made to Abraham, we were under the law yet to inherit the promise of God. We were heirs in in promise, but not in practice. Uh, we were actually functional slaves. We were held in bondage by the law, which we see in Galatians three twenty four. And, and Paul tells us what we were enslaved to, uh, namely the elementary principles of the world, uh, translated elsewhere, the elementary spirits of the universe. And Paul sort of expands on this in verse 8 where he states that we were in bondage to beings that by nature are no gods. Uh, John Stott suggests that these are demons or evil spirits. Uh, and what Paul is suggesting is that the devil took this good thing, uh, the law, and, and he twisted it for his own evil purposes in order to enslave men and women. And I think Stott is, is correct here. Uh, we see throughout this letter uh, the false gospel that says justification is through Christ plus works of the law, such, such as circumcision. circumcision. And, and the false teachers clearly distorted what the law was given for. And so instead of being used to show us that, you know, uh, uh, that we, can't, we can obey, pointing to Christ, and that's not the full purpose of the law, but it is a way to, to, to look at it in that uh, the law is given to show us the standard of God uh, we were to live up to that. We are to live uh, in accordance to God's word, but without apart from Christ and his spirit, certainly we can't. Therefore, it points us to Christ, the one who, 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 um, who did fulfill the law and died for our sins. So instead of being used in that manner, uh, the law by the Judaizers was being used uh, as a requirement for justification, a requirement for salvation. And Paul is showing the Galatians the error into which they have fallen. He's saying, he's reminding them of what life was like before they knew Christ. He is reminding us all of what life was like before Christ. He's reminding us of um, the times where we, we tried and we failed to obey the law, uh, in turn pointing us to, to Christ. And so um, He's showing how living under the law is living in bondage, is living in slavery. But in the next verse, Paul is going to show us um, the promise fulfilled and, and what it means uh, to actually be adopted sons and daughters of God. So Paul begins here in verses 4 through 7, again, by showing us what it's like to live as adopted sons of God. And he, uh, we see the first um, verses 4 and 5, it's telling us, about the sending of the Son of God. And so Paul begins by telling the Galatians that the date set by the Father had arrived, that, that date being uh, the date that was planned before the foundation of the world. And it finally arrived. He said, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. So what does he mean by the fullness of time has come? Well, scholars point out that there were uh, there are many um, factors involved here uh, sociologically. So, for example, uh, 
Uh, Rome had conquered uh, the known world. Uh, they had established roads uh, that made traveling easier, and so that facilitated uh, the spread of the gospel. But the Greek language and culture had become universal, and again, that facilitates the spread of the gospel. There was a deep spiritual hunger throughout Rome, uh, which plays into that. And secondly, and most importantly, um, as we've already stated, this was the very time in history that the Father had chosen. So, you know, all those um, other things aside, the most important fact is that this is the time that the Father had chosen. As we read in Ephesians 1-4 this morning, that he, he chose this before the foundation of the world. Um, so the law, in a sense, had prepared a hunger for the promise, which would now be fulfilled because God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem and to adopt those under the law. Now, Paul qualifies God's sending of his son by stating some of Jesus' qualifications here. Uh, he says he was born, um, born of a woman. Uh, what we see here is that he is both fully God and fully man. Uh, we see that in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, where we see that Jesus, in the very form of God, in his very essence, he is God. Uh, he came to take on the form of a slave in the likeness of men. So he, he takes on human flesh. He doesn't empty himself of, of his uh, deity. He assumes he takes on human flesh. Moreover, he was also born under the law. So he was born a, a Jewish man. He lived a thoroughly Jewish life. But unlike us, Christ obeyed the law completely. So he lived a perfect life and, and died for our sins so that we might be redeemed to God. And so we see this in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake, God made him to be sin who knew no sin. This is talking about Christ. Why? So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. So redeemed and made righteous. We see we, we see in two important aspects there, redeemed and righteous, in that we are, we are justified, we are, we are claimed as adopted, uh, but at the same time, we are continually, through our sanctification process, made righteous, uh, continually being made into the image uh, of the Son. And so next we see in verses 6 through 7, uh, the sending of the Spirit. So we see the sending of the Son, which uh, accomplishes our uh, adoption, as we saw this morning. And now we see a little bit of insight into the sending of the Spirit, which which guarantees and applies our adoption. Uh, it's the experiential part of, of our adoption, if you will. Uh, so we see that in verses 6 through 7. So God sends forth His Spirit into our hearts, uh, that believers may be able to cry, Abba, Father. Uh, so Romans 8, 15, and 16 expounds on this where we were this morning, stating, When we cry, Abba, Father, it is the Spirit Himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So what this is, is showing us that the Spirit of God is our internal witness that we are actually sons of God. So it's really important here that there's there's a trinitarian nature to salvation, right? In that in that God sent His Son uh, to die for us and His Spirit to live in us. Stott says it like this: He sent His Son that we might have the status of sonship, and He sent His sent His Spirit that we might have the experience of it. Um, so now, because the the Spirit indwells us, we can experience what it is like to have intimacy, to have the intimacy of a father-son relationship with the God of the universe. And, and we can now come to the Father, right, with, with confidence, whether we are loved, accepted, uh, beyond measure as adopted children of the Father. And, and so Paul concludes by, by writing, so you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. And so because of what God has done for us through the promised Christ, we are no longer enslaved to the law and to sin and to death, but, but we're free in Christ to approach the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and so that, that has vast implications for, for our lives, you know, how, uh, how we pray, how we go through, uh, through the Father's discipline, how the Father uh, looks upon us, how we look upon Him, how 
uh, how we pro progress through our sanctification uh, process. And, and I mean, it's just vast implications for our life. We are now sons and daughters and we are heirs through God. Now, we don't we don't experience that full inheritance now. We will one day. We talked about that uh, this morning, but we can begin to experience already what it's like to be a son of God. So just to conclude, let us, uh, and I think this is very important for us as we move forward, just rejoice in the fact uh, that you have been redeemed through Christ. And then never forget, um, certainly, that we're saved by grace uh, alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Don't don't forget that. Um, that's obviously very, very important. But, but, you know, I wonder how often do we stop there? Right? How, how often are we simply satisfied with being justified before uh, the Father uh, when He wants us to see that we are redeemed for a purpose? We are redeemed so that we, uh, in order to be adopted into His family. So, right, how often do we see God as simply a, a judge, right, instead of a father? It, you know, we call Him Father a lot, but how do we, do we live it, right? You see, oftentimes, uh, it's speaking of human adoption, when someone's adopted, they're rescued from a very dire situation. Uh, they might be given food and, you know, clothes and water and shelter, but that's not all. Hopefully, they're they're also very deeply uh, loved, and they, and they recognize the, the grace and the love and the mercy that's been shown uh, to them, and, and hopefully, uh, they begin to live out that experience as a son or a daughter. So the same is true for us. We're not simply saved. We, we are, but we're also loved uh, by the Father. So let's rejoice in the fact that we are adopted sons and daughters of the Father, and therefore we are deeply, deeply loved. Let us pray. Father, uh, we thank you for this passage. We thank you that we're able to just dive a little bit deeper into what um, we we're speaking of this morning. We thank you that Christ came to redeem at the right time, we thank you that your love for us and uh, was eternal and is eternal and will never end. Uh, we thank you, Father, um, that you have adopted us into your family, uh, that you have sent forth your spirit in which we can cry to you, Abba, Father. Uh, so, Father, help us to live uh, not just as saved individuals, but help us to live as adopted children. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.